All right, have an anonymous letter here. Got this a while back, and I've been wanting to answer this, but I just haven't been able to. No name, no address. We, uh, we just got this. Ten questions. So I'll have to just say ten questions from an, an anonymous reader. Number one, in your opinion, what is a good way to conduct effective research on anything? Well, um, anything but the Internet. <laughs> I can say it that way. Effective research. Stay away from online sources. Now, the uh, online sources are a good way to do some research. Um, if it's just kind of a, a, a smaller kind of, you know, just to prove that Catholics are getting, you know, messed up or whatever, well, you can just get a few articles. You don't have to do some huge in-depth study. Um, if you want to do a more in-depth study, then I'd really stay away from the Internet as much as possible simply because um, the Internet is always changing. You know, I've done so many times, I, don't, I lost track, uh, where I will quote a, a website or whatever link to a video and it, the video goes down, the website disappears, and then you're kind of left there, oh, okay, you know, or they'll change the, the things that they've written. Can't tell you how many times that's happened. You take a paper-based book, uh, you know, I'll just grab one of my wife's books right here. Okay, you want to show that pharmaceutical drugs are bad. Okay, here you go. How about the uh, 2012 Drug Interaction Facts, the Authority on Drug Interactions, um, Doctor of Pharmacy there, something like that. You open it up and there's uh, all of the different drugs, side effects, all the different stuff. Um, the way it takes longer. Okay, you're going to have to go through quite a bit of books and, and research and the whole deal. Um, but that's the most effective way to do research. Uh, when it comes to preaching and teaching from the Word of God, um, nothing beats just simple, old-fashioned study. Read. Do word studies. Um, read. Sometimes the Lord's just going to say, okay, you need to read the whole book. <laughs> You know, uh, I want to show you different things that the Bible says, sources of wisdom. Okay, read the whole book of Proverbs. Well, that's going to take a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will. That's research. So, um, online sources are okay in some ways. Wikipedia is a good starting place, but that's not the final, you know, for your work. It's the final source. Is great for figuring out what the keywords are that will get you to where you want to go in your research, but it should not be your definitive source for proving a point. Mm -hmm. If you heard what my wife said there, she said it's a good way to get keywords. You know, um, you're searching somebody or what are they involved with or whatever else. You can go in there and you'll see their different uh, affiliations and, and whatever else. So, good starting place, but certainly not the final authority. Uh, number two, what are the gifts of the Holy Ghost and does every Christian receive all of them once they get saved? Um, well, there are different gifts there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about those gifts of healing, gifts of tongues, interpretation of tongues. Uh, when it says tongues, by the way, it just means languages. There are some Christians that can learn multiple languages. They do very good at that. Um, I'm not real great at that. Uh, gifts of healing, gifts, plural of healing. Um, there's a lot of different ways to heal people, be it herbology or nutrition or exercise, uh, things like that. Um, there's different gifts, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14 shows the gifts that are available today. Um, the sign gifts that are given in Mark, let me just show you here real quickly. Um, there are sign gifts that were given to confirm the word. Mark chapter 16 um, verse 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall, shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover." these signs. So you have the early Holy Ghost signs there of miraculous healing where they could touch somebody and say, be healed in the name of the Lord Jesus, boom, and they're healed of whatever. Okay, Those signs aren't there anymore. Okay, They were there to confirm 
Jesus Christ was the Messiah, nation of Israel. The Jews require a sign. First Corinthians chapter one talks about that. And here are the sign gifts of an apostle showing the miraculous power of, of the Holy Spirit. That stuff is gone now. Okay, anybody says it's there, well, tell them to perform all the stuff there in Mark chapter 16. They can't. Um, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through you know, chapter 13, chapter 14, those are the gifts that are available today. And no, you don't get all of them. You know, it says about to one is the gift of this and the one is the gift of that. I don't have every, of every gift that's given, Holy Spirit gift, nor can I attain to those different gifts. Okay, there's some that are not for me. So, um, number three, how do you become a Bible scholar? By selling your soul to the devil. <laughs> uh, excuse me, I, I had to put that in there. Um, well, what do you mean by Bible scholar? Okay, um, if you're saying studying the Bible, well, just read it. Uh, people will think that you're a scholar eventually because you've read it so many times and the Lord showed you the truth. You have to be born again. You know, natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. You know, uh, their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, I believe it is. You have to be born again, first and foremost. Um, but I, I don't like the term scholar, okay? Um, it implies some kind of a, a, a Nicolaitan type of I'm above you, you're below me, eh, you know, kind of a little bit sketchy there. And if you get into the thing of naturalistic textual criticism where you start to go and say, well, this manuscript here and this, this reading here and this papyrus fragment here and this unsealed manuscript and this and that, and whatever. well, you look like a Bible scholar, but you're just a Bible rejecter. So, and you know, your, your authority is yourself, not, you know, a book that you can hold in your hands that you can give to the common man on the street. So I would avoid trying to be a Bible scholar. Um, number four, how do you get closer to God? Um, by obeying his word. Get born again. When he saves you, he'll start to sanctify things out of your life. Sanctification means set apart. So when the Lord saves you, it's like a big, it's like a big crowd of, of people. And you see a you know, hand kind of, I'm speaking figuratively here, this doesn't actually happen, but you see a big hand come down from heaven and boink, gets you like the, like the games, you know, the arcade thing and you the little joysticks and your little crane goes over and grabs a stuffed animal. Well, that little thing, the Lord goes, boink, and he picks you up like this, pulls you up out of the crowd, comes over and says, I'm going to set you apart. Drops you down a little thing and he pulls you out. And he says, okay, now you're not going to be in there with the flashing lights and the blaring music, and you're not going to be around those other, you know, stuffed animals, so to speak, and you're, you're going to come out, you're going to do this, and you're going to do that for me, and he sets you apart, you see. Um, so how do you get closer to God? Salvation, sanctification. Um, does God reveal secrets? Yes. Um, I'm trying to think of the verse of Scripture about a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. Uh, give me a minute here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm trying to think of what it is. Uh, let me just look up the word secrets. But there's certainly a lot of things, the secret things of Scripture. There's things that the lost world can't get, as I've said. They just don't understand it. Uh, again, Strong's Concordance, it just has the all the different words that are in the King James Bible, so you can look it up. There's computer programs that you can get to, but... Um, this is a good way to do it a lot of times. Um, yeah, it's in Daniel chapter 2. Let me give you that verse real quick here. My, I should have known where that was at, but my brain is just kind of, you know, start answering letters, and after about three hours, you just kind of... Uh, so, Daniel chapter 2. Uh, verse 28, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And he goes on to tell him. But, you know, right there, um, 
verse 22 of the same chapter, Daniel chapter 2, verse 22. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. So the Lord will give understanding of secrets, things that don't make sense to lost people. So, yes, God does reveal secrets. Number six, what does it mean to use God's name in vain? Um, when you are using God's name as a cuss word, um, when you if if you would go out into the woods and you and you say, I want to, I got to get to know God, and you you're tired of your life and you're you're just miserable, and you just say, Oh my God, please help me. It's not really your God yet, but you know that's not using His name in vain. But if you go and you see some good-looking girl and you say, oh my, G-O-D, she's hot. So I don't even want to say it, you know. Or, or you know, oh, my G-O-D, this, this thing's really getting this or that. It's really bothering me. You know, what are you saying? Are you really talking to God? No, you're using His name in vain, okay? Um, and there's a lot of other ways to do it. You know, there's the, you know, God, D-A-M-N, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to take God's name in vain and even saying, you know, Jesus Christ or something and when it's just used as a cuss word. And, you know, people will come up with other things, gall darn it and gosh darn it and whatever else. That's just different ways of saying God, D-A-M-N. I don't use profanity because I'm saved. Um, and a real quick way that you can tell if somebody's saved or lost is people that cuss and they have no restraint on their mouth, they're lost. Simple. I didn't say if you hit your hammer, hit your thumb with a hammer and the word slips out, but you instantly, oh, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. You, you'll, you'll feel guilty about it. But you get these people, I'm a Christian, blankety blank, 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 blank. They're lost. Simple. Number seven, what does it mean to become one flesh with your spouse? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. First Corinthians chapter 7. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, fornication is sex outside of marriage, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the wife, husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. There is nothing wrong with intimacy within marriage. Um, that's there's completely fine. The marriage bed is honorable, the Bible says. So um, when you become one flesh, there's a spiritual principle there that when a, a man and a woman come together and have sexual intercourse, so they become one flesh. Just to be very blunt about it. Um, that's why fornication is a sin, because you're doing that marriage act with no intention to live together, with no intention of the man saying, I'm going to provide for you spiritually here. Um, uh, women are spiritually uh, weaker vessels, according to the Bible. Okay, you might have a woman that's actually physically bigger than her husband, and she's not weaker in the sense of physical you know, power. Um, she's actually stronger, but spiritually she's still weaker. And that man is supposed to be there as a spiritual covering for her. And if it's just a one-night stand or just a little fun fling or whatever else, he's not a spiritual covering. That's fornication. So becoming one flesh with your spouse is being married and uh, coming together in intimacy. Number eight, I got saved at the age of 12 and, and Jesus started his ministry at 12. Do you think that's a coincidence? Jesus did not start his ministry at 12. Jesus asked the doctors of law and everything, he asked them questions. That's not a ministry. Okay, um, Jesus didn't start his ministry, his earthly ministry, till he was 30. All right, very instructive to you out there if you're in your teens or in your 20s. Okay, um, you, the ministry of reconciliation is there. You should try to get people saved and whatever else, but uh, you're not ready for ministry full time. Unless you know more than Jesus Christ did. Okay, and I, I think it's one of the funniest things out there when I get these young guys in their 20s or whatever else, or even in their teens, and they rebuke me. That's just kind of a, okay, you know. 
I remember there was this little Anderson guy and whatever, little follower of Steven Anderson, this little Hispanic guy, and that little tiny boy, I mean, he's, you know, nine or ten years old or something, and he's rebuking me, you know, and stuff. I rebuke Brian Denninger, you know. Grow up. <laughs> you know, good night. You can rebuke me until nap time, okay? Um, yeah. Number nine. When going through bad times, how do you praise the Lord? Um, by relying on Him and praising Him in those bad times. Uh, not quitting. Not being a, a loser and saying, well, I just, you know, I, I can't praise the Lord right now, whatever. You praise Him, that's, you kind of answered your own question there. Praise the Lord in bad times, and that's true praise. And finally, number 10, do you believe in good vibes? Um, I'm not really into electrical uh, back massagers, um, so I'm not really into good vibrations, you know. It's a joke there. It's a joke. Joke. Um, <laughs> good vibes as in good feelings. Uh, I get kind of a good vibe from somebody. No, I, get into, I, I believe in spiritual discernment, okay? And you get around some people and, and things, and, and you just kind of, uh, I feel kind of weird around you. Um, that's spiritual discernment when you're saved. That's not a good vibe. I understand the, the, what people would mean by that, but I try to stick with uh, biblical terminology. And, um, you know, when the, the, the Spirit gives you discernment about things, um, you'll be places. I remember, um, excuse me, my wife and I went to this Catholic store the one time. We didn't even know it was Catholic. It was in New York. McCarthy's and uh, Victorian, I think. Yeah. McCarthy's, McCartney's or McCarthy? I think McCarthy's. McCarthy's, I think, an emporium or something. Went in, didn't know what it was. And we walk in there, and you walk in, and it was just this feeling of, Ugh. And, you know, and we start walking around. Oh, there's statues of Mary. Oh, okay. And, oh, there's saint candles, you know, and burning incense to different saints, and you're walking around, and, Catholic, oh, oh, there's rosaries, oh, oh, and we're kind of, okay, we're in the wrong place. Well, while we're here, you know, tracks being put out, and and, and this Catholic came over, and he's, you know, can we help you find anything? No, thank you. <laughs> here you go, here you go, tracks out. Okay, time to leave, you know. Got out of there, went to the Ephrata Cloister, my wife and I, the one time, and it was just this really uh, creepy feeling, you know, these bunch of witches and stuff that are there the uh, Rosicrucians, the oldest Rosicrucian colony in America. So it's a, it wasn't a good vibe or a bad vibe. It was just the Holy Spirit giving us discernment. So answer to those questions, go on to the next letter. <laughs>